often seen as an overly melancholic field of occupation built solely on emotions, whereas math to most people appears as a dry technical field that only requires computation and no creative thinking. In fact, both math and art require vivid imagination and stand closer together than is popularly believed. Of course, you can paint mathematic ideas and analyze paintings through math, but the two share something more than simply each other's analytical applicability. Both mathematics and art discover patterns in the real world, turn them into abstract representations and create ways of applying these representations back to reality for the sake of its betterment. My personal interest in the link between math and art started from a rather discouraging anti-example. In one of the many math courses I have taken throughout my academic career, I once had to do a quiz. It consisted of a single task to build a graph of a function. In order to do that, you had to follow nine steps to solve nine mini problems. It wasn't really my day then, and somewhere in the middle I got confused, so the graph, of course, did not look right. But honestly, I treated it the way I treated everything in math and in life as a piece of art. So I colored it in glittering pens as I would do with an artwork. A week later, when we got the results, there was a single comment next to the graph, which sounded almost like a verdict. Too much imagination. At the time, I got a good laugh out of it, and I'm sure the person who graded the quizzes had even more fun but it left me with a bitter impression that imagination is often perceived to be distant from or boldly incompatible with mathematics, a conviction I by no means share. So today I will try to show you the, li the, the link between math and art in the mind work of artists and mathematicians, in the abstract formulas they create and in the tools they use to do so. The very first intersection between math and art is introduced to us in primary schools as we are taught to look for geometric shapes in artwork. But as we grow, the visual content we are exposed to gets more and more intricate. And to analyze such complex visuals, Henrik Jensen from the Imperial College London has suggested to use fractals. Now, in math, a fractal is an abstract model which is used to simulate a natural object whereby a detail of this object is taken and repeated to create a general pattern that reflects the structure of the whole. In other words, the most important characteristic of a fractal is its self-similarity. Perhaps the most vivid example of the fractal would be the Sierpinski triangle. You can see it's made out of little triangles, so it's self-similar in this way. Generally, because of the consistency of geometric figures, it is very easy to recognize them, even though you may be given just a few details. An artist often engage with the viewer's imagination this way by creating ordered and unordered areas of patterns. The very first example of an artwork like this I could think of was in fact my own. I did it about five years ago, so long before I discovered the link between fractals and art. And here you can see the smaller leaf-like shapes fill in the bigger leaves with the overall picture being like that, highly ornamental. But the artist's objective might be exactly the opposite. For example, to hide the bigger picture from you by filling it with shapes unrepresentative of the central object. Here I try to hide the face and the mane of the line behind untypical shapes and a symbolic landscape. Sometimes an overly ornamental artist will have some mercy as to give their viewer a central point around which to assemble the arrays of patterns so you can see the bigger picture. Here such point is the eyes and if you do not assemble the face right away, don't worry, it even took me some time after I drew this. But I actually prefer to get lost in artwork and not to see any bigger picture whatsoever. 
The conceptual similarity between art and myth can be further seen in the abstract formulas that are created to represent the world. Sometimes it takes an artist month or even years in certain cases to put together all the elements of a successful art formula. And those can be psychology, culture studies, politics, and sometimes even legal studies. All to create a viable act of visual communication. Similarly, in math, if you do not substitute the right variables with the right numbers, the formula will simply not work. And in order to do that correctly, you need to pull together all your knowledge from all areas of math and subsequently life. In art and graphic design, we use the formula of the so-called three Fs to evaluate visuals. The three Fs stand for form, feeling and function. And it means that a good piece of art and graphic design will have the overall form that allows for an effective expression of the intended message, while also evoking a certain planned emotional response and conveying the overall function, whatever it might be. Maybe a call to action or an expression of empathy. So if we can assess art this way, let's try to evaluate some math according to the same principle. Taking the formula of i squared equals to minus 1, where i is an imaginary number, you can see that the formula only has the required components and that it conveys the overall message that the principal square root of minus 1 will be i. Now, this formula does not openly convey the, the initial confusion that the audience might have that a squared number may in fact be negative. But some math concepts do convey emotions in a very open manner. Benoit Mandorbo, who coined the, form f the term fractal, first described it like this, beautiful, damn hard, and increasingly useful, adding an almost poetic touch to fractals. Lastly, math and art have been largely integrated in the field of technology, to the point where even the colors can be expressed in numerical values. Digital artists and graphic designers do not simply pick a color from a digital palette, they build it instead. And they do it by defining the ratios of four base colors, which are cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And these colors can form any imaginable color. So let's take 18% cyan, which is the color of the letters on the screen, then eight 28% magenta, which is the color you can see now, 0% yellow, the color does not change, and finally 15% black. And like this, you can get the light pastel purple in Photoshop, for example. Considering also that every visual effect in illustration and graphic design software can be expressed mathematically, one may wonder if after a day of designing digital masterpieces, an amazed viewer should tell you, oh, you're such an artist, or actually, oh, you're such a mathematician. Likewise, having spent hours and hours solving math problems in a way similar to this by Leonardo da Vinci, it would make perfect sense for you to hear that your math is rather artsy or utterly beautiful, especially given how much imagination it takes to derive every math formula and how much logical elegancy it takes to use one. These similarities between math and art are not so easy to see. As a result, the language of math often appears less intelligible than the language of art, but we can try to interpret between the two. It is true that this talk reflects my greater exposure to the fields of art and graphic design than to the field of math, due to the nature of my studies and work, but I believe it is important to start a conversation between the two fields that are so wrongfully considered to be so far apart. I hope this talk inspires some more love for math and some more understanding of the technicalities of art. And I hope that by pointing out how conceptually similar math and art are, I have 
managed to at least a little bit decrease the ideological rivalry between mathematicians and artists in principle, as well as math majors and social science majors on campus. And if we teach math the way we teach art, and if we sometimes teach art the way we teach math, maybe we can all just profoundly enjoy both. Thank you.